Hello and welcome to another episode of Wheel of Horror, the podcast where two best friends normally spin a wheel and it normally chooses the horror film, but today we have a very special episode. Today we are talking to Chris McKinnell, who is the grandson of Ed and Lorraine Warren. And uh, if you don't know who they are, they are the famous demonologists who we're going to learn a lot more about today because we have the very special privilege of speaking to their grandson. So Chris, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much, Alec. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, this is absolutely, I am ecstatic for this episode. We don't do a lot of interviews. It's mostly just kind of like a movie review and discuss podcast. But to actually be able to speak to somebody that has so much experience, but also to shed a little bit of light on the films, too, that we we have covered in the past. Yeah, Conjuring and The Nun and all of those. Annabelle, of course. So exactly. I'm very excited to start picking your brain about that. But first of all, I just wanted to uh, ask, so you're in Paraguay right now, right? That's right. Yeah, I'm in Asuncion. I've lived in over 90 places in the world. I am constantly traveling. I'm the director of something called the Warren Legacy Foundation for Paranormal Research. Mm -hmm. We carry on the work of my grandparents all over the world. And uh, we have over 100 members who dedicate themselves completely voluntarily uh, we don't charge for our services, and all of our services are anonymous. We would never expose our clients to the public, but we're there to help. And I go out into the world. I learn how the paranormal manifests differently according to different cultures, how those cultures deal with it. And I also look for good people that we can recruit in those countries. Right now, I'm in Paraguay. That's so cool. So 90 countries. I mean... And so, I mean, you must have been doing this for decades at this point then. Oh, yeah. I started in uh, actually August of 1980. So it's been 43 years this month. Wow. Oh, my God. Yeah. So I guess a little bit of context here. So you you knew my parents back in the late 80s, right? Oh, yeah. I was in their wedding. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So I guess you kind of met me. My mom was pregnant at the wedding with me. So Oh, yeah. I was at your christening. That's so crazy. Yeah, because <laughs> I, I, you know, I don't really know you, but I mean, that's so cool that you, you were there, you know, 34 years ago almost now. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess that leads me to my first question. Then. So where did you specifically grow up? Uh huh. Well, everywhere. Oh. But uh, most of my childhood was in Connecticut, mm. many places in Connecticut. Okay. And that's where your grandparents are from. That Their house, is it in Monroe or? Monroe, Monroe, Connecticut. That's right. Right. Okay. So were you in that area? For some of it, I was in Bridgeport when I was born. Mm-hmm. I lived with my great grandparents, uh, Lorraine's parents oh. when I was born. And uh, then we were in Ohio, then uh, Oxford and Newtown, Connecticut, uh, which isn't far from Monroe. So I was close to my grandparents at that point. Mm. And uh, then we moved around quite a bit more. My father was always looking for work, new opportunities and he was a, quite a successful businessman. Hmm. So we moved around a lot. And how did you end up meeting my parents? Because it was in Connecticut. And that's right. Yeah. No, I was a friend of a mutual friend of theirs, uh, a guy named Roger. Hmm. And we went to college together, he and I. And I am a, I was a comic book nerd. And your parent, your your father and your uncle both collected comics. Oh, yeah. So Roger thought it'd be fun for us to meet and we all hit it off and oh yeah your family is very near and dear to me wow that's nice to hear and yeah my dad and uncle are both humongous comic book fans so still to this day oh i know (laughs) we were just talking about it the other day ah that's awesome so yeah you know connecticut's always it's always been spooky i mean it's kind of one of those states that it's kind of known for having paranormal things that have happened. Oh, absolutely. Like uh, uh, the haunting in Connecticut. That was actually my case. Was it? Okay. Oh my God. All right. So I know quite a bit about that. So let's talk about that. So that one was, sure. there was a family from Massachusetts and the son had cancer. Is that right? Uh, Leukemia. That's right. Leukemia. And they were actually, I think they were from New York, uh, not Massachusetts. Oh, and they had to travel every day to Yukon medical center for his treatments. And so Carmen, the mother, was looking for a place they could live, and she found this old funeral home in Southington, Connecticut. And at the time, she didn't care there was a funeral home or anything. They didn't believe in the paranormal. They just were looking for a place that they can move into quickly. And it still had 
the embalming table and chemicals and uh, grave plaques in the basement. It was bizarre. It was being sold as a residential place, too? Well, being rented out, yes. Oh, it's rented, okay. Yeah. The top floor was already being rented out to another woman, and then they took the bottom two floors, Mm -hmm. the basement with the embalming room, as as well as a second room off of there, which is where the boy with leukemia ended up sleeping. Right. He loved it at first, but he kept seeing people through the French doors looking at him from the embalming room. Oh, my God. Yeah. I, I, I have to point out, that movie was so bad that I only made it through the first 45 minutes. Okay. It, it was just horrible. There's nothing true about it. I was in that house every single night for nine and a half weeks and it was horrifying but it was not what the book which is called in a dark place or the movie those are incorrect if you go to um youtube you can see a haunting in connecticut which was a discovery channel documentary that they did Mm -hmm. on it and that was about two hour long last time i checked it was still available on youtube that's pretty good. I'm not mentioned in it because at the at that time, I wasn't allowing anybody to use my name. I was avoiding publicity. Hmm. I had done Geraldo and a bunch of other talk shows back in the day, and I really didn't like it. Hmm. So I kind of was hiding behind my grandmother's skirts. <laughs> <laughs> so this specific one the the, uh, the haunting in connecticut case what what would you call that one was there like an actual title for that uh it was an incubus case which means inhuman entity that attacks women sexually and violently it also attacked her husband and sodomized him oh my god yeah he actually came out and said that in public during an interview which i thought was incredibly brave because this guy worked in a stone quarry and, you know, admitting that he got sodomized by a, something that he considered to be a demon. Right. That takes balls. Yeah, that. OK, so so you you spent nine, nine weeks there and the young boy had been seeing, you know, ghosts through through the French doors. Oh, more, much more than that. I didn't get there until he was removed. What had happened was he started seeing, like, for instance, his little sister. He saw her come down the stairs, looking at him and teasing him, and then run up the stairs. He ran after her, and his parents were like, what are you doing running in the house? Hmm. He says, my sister was just downstairs. So, no, she's been asleep for the last two hours, and she was. So that was something called a doppelganger, which is a double image that can appear to confuse people in a home. Then all of the crucifixes that were up around the house all disappeared, leaving outlines of the crucifixes on the walls. And he started becoming very violent, very dark. They thought it was a reaction to his cancer treatments. So he was diagnosed with schizophrenia and he was put in an institute. And as soon as that happened, then it started attacking both Carmen and her niece, Tammy, who lived in the house. At which point they called my grandparents and my grandfather sent me in. Wow. Oh, my God. All right. So... At that point, you're you're going there daily, basically assessing the situation. It had so it it wasn't that it was attached to the boy; it was clearly attached to the house or the the funeral parlor. Exactly. Huh. And they had given up everything to move down there to take care of their son, so they didn't have the resources to get out. At that point, they had to take care of the problem. You know, people often say, well, why don't you just run away? Well, yeah. how many of us can just get up and move when we want to? Right. I know. People always say, they're like, why don't you just go to a hotel? I'm like, well, how long can you stay there? I mean, how long exactly. can you charge a credit card night after night if you're already in duress? Yeah. And I've had plenty of families try to do that. And often the things will follow. I mean, this thing would attack me at work. It would attack my grandfather. It was not just bound to the house. So how did that all end? Well, after we gathered enough information to bring it to the church and we strong armed the church because they don't like to do anything that might be in the public eye. And my grandfather's modus operandi was always to make something public to kind of shame the church into working with them. Hmm. 
I don't agree with that. I don't agree with exposing clients, but at the time there wasn't the internet or anything like that. And my grandfather had to have some way of publicizing what they did so that people could find them when they, you know, when they needed help. Right. It's not something we have to do anymore. Thank God. But they did come in. There were two or three priests, as I recall, and they did a complete cleansing. Oh, I forgot to mention that woman that lived on the top floor. Right. She also came to me and said that she was being attacked sexually. (sighs) Weirdly, though, she said she liked it. What? Yeah. That's actually, there's plenty of historical stories of women having these kind of bizarre lovers throughout time. And they're just incubuses, you think? Well, I'll be honest with you, Alec, I don't believe in demons. Hmm. You know, uh, yes, my grandfather was a demonologist, but I've traveled all over the world. And I've seen that these things manifest according to our cultural and spiritual beliefs. So you'll never get, for instance, a Buddhist spirit in a Hindu home. Right. It just doesn't happen. You know, it's always going to be according to your beliefs or the beliefs of perhaps the people who have been there before you who may have manifested this thing. I think that these things are thought forms that take on a life of their own. Uh, It's also called an egregore or a tulpa. And don't get me wrong. They do have energy and they can be deadly. I've had two cases where two possessed men were killed. Hmm, Jeez. Yeah, so this is not a game, and it you know it bugs me when people say, "Oh, I'm a psychic investigator, and I'm out there doing this and that." And what they're really doing is trying to stir things up so that they can get a two second video of a knocking noise or something. Okay, and they don't really help the families. For me, this is all about helping others. That's all. I don't even like the paranormal per se. I do this only because there's a real need. And forgive me, I've got four kittens right <laughs> next to me. So you're going to hear them occasionally. That There's no spirits coming through. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, I could hear them, but I was like, you know what? It adds a nice ambiance, so I kind of liked it. <laughs> well, I don't want to bounce around too much because I do want to ask you about those paranormal shows later. But so back to the uh, the, the priest. So, the, so this incubus or, you know, what, what you had thought it was, it had been haunting the family, then it haunted you, and then it was haunting the woman upstairs, too. So yes, how could something like that, like, if if it is like a thought energy, basically, that's being projected by, by the person, how could it, you know, bounce around like that? Well, in witchcraft, and I hate magic. I hate the idea of magic. For me, it's quantum physics. It's manifesting something through your energy. There is something in witchcraft called an egregore. An egregore is a spirit created by the witch with a specific job to do. And then once it's completed that mission, it then the energy will dissipate. Hmm. But if you don't do it properly, then that spirit no longer has a deadline and it can take on a life of its own. It can grow out of proportion and it can become very dangerous like poltergeist phenomena. Huh. So do you think that these things can get recycled? So like, let's say that this was started 200 years ago, like this, this thing was made for a purpose. It fulfills that purpose. And then it just kind of does what it wants throughout the rest of time. If it's not programmed to dissipate afterward. Yes. If it were created unintentionally, for instance, to me, this is actually reassuring in a way because it shows us how much amazing energy we have. And what we're capable of if we learn how to use it properly. If, if you ever study, for instance, what Tibetan monks are capable of or uh, fakirs in, uh, in India, it's extraordinary. They are capable of superhuman feats. And we are all capable of that if we learn how to harness our energy properly. Well, I would say you traveling so much, you would definitely get insights into all of these, this variety of, of exactly. cultures. Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm very blessed. That's so cool. And sorry, the, my, my movie brain is going off here. It, it just reminds me of Ghostbusters in a way, like capturing the energy, putting it into like an actual box and kind of containing it there. Like it is like a real energy. 
Oh, I wish it was that simple. I know. I mean, I do know of rituals that try to do something like that, exactly like that, to mm-hmm. box the energy. I've never done it myself. Well, that kind of, I guess, would lead into some things that maybe your grandparents at their their museum would, would hold. I mean, like, I think of like the yes. Annabelle doll. You know, that's something I'm sure people are very interested in hearing about. I, you know, I think the worst part of my grandparents' legacy is that they ever called it a museum. Mm. It was never a public venue, ever. It, yes, they would invite people occasionally, but today it's that's not even allowed. Local zoning laws uh, have made it so nobody's allowed to go in there. Really? Yeah, okay. and it, it's a place for containing the energies so that they won't spill out into the world again and hurt others. That's what it's for. It's a prison. Yeah, and I guess, you know, the movie, obviously, like I've I've it makes it seem like yeah it's a it's a place where all of these evil things are housed and there's signs on certain things and i've seen pictures online of the real annabelle doll and it's like a raggedy ann doll yes so who would like, get invited to something like that well my grandparents used to host little talks at their houses okay and then they would show it to people or maybe a police officer would come over or you know friends might inquire and they'd say yeah come on down i'll show you but make sure you don't touch anything right because when your energy interacts with its energy if you are someone with an underlying vulnerability if you're particularly susceptible to that energy versus perhaps another one that's in the in the building it may interact with you and cause some real damage okay so it's not every single person that would touch every single thing it would affect them, but it's it's different people would get affected differently by different things. Yeah, it's kind of Russian roulette. Interesting. Yeah, because I was going to say, like, how would people even know if they were interacting with something in reality? You go to, like, an antique store or something like that, and you pick up something, and you have no idea, really. Exactly. And that, actually, we get plenty of people uh, who do that. I, I used to go into antique stores practicing my psychic abilities, seeing what I would pick up, and then talking to the store owner about... Hey, tell me, you know, the story behind this particular piece and see if I, what I picked up was accurate or not. Wow. You know, so actually talk about that a little bit. So yeah, psychic ability. How would you define yourself? See, I don't like labels. Okay. I think labels are limiting. And I mean, if I have to say I am a psychic medium who's terribly uncomfortable with his abilities. Interesting. I don't trust them. I don't trust myself. I don't trust any psychic, including my grandmother, without evidence. I mean, mm-hmm. don't get me wrong. I saw my grandmother do things that, hell, she could have been an X man. <laughs> I mean, truly, she was extraordinary. But without evidence, I'm not going to believe it. I we When I was 14, we were uh, being interviewed by, I think it was PM Magazine or Inside Edition, and they brought us to this house in Ohio. We weren't even allowed to go in the house. We had to stay out on the street. And there was a local reporter with us. And my grandmother starts describing this apparition of a big, sweaty, fat man with a bloody butcher's apron, the smell of rotting meat coming from under the kitchen sink, all sorts of stuff. And while she's describing all of this stuff, the local reporter who has been researching to write a story on the house is showing me his notes and they are all in there. I was like, holy crap. Jeez. But that's what I mean. Without evidence, I wouldn't have believed it. Yeah. But then stuff like that confirms it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've I've talked to a few people that have met your grandmother and, you know, my friend Emily met her as a child and she was like, yeah, I could just, she she was so honed in on everything I was saying and I felt like she was really listening to me and just, I don't know, did you feel the same way about your grandmother? Like you just could trust her and she really believed what you were saying? My grandmother was a saint. She was such a sweet angel. I mean, honestly, see, I knew my grandmother as my grandmother, of course. Mm -hmm. So for me... I'd walk in the door and it's like, oh, hi, honey. Do you want a grilled cheese? You want me to make you some cookies? Yeah. No, it's like she was constantly doting on us. Christmas, uh, she would give us all like 30 or 40 gifts each. It wow. was a production. I don't know how she did it. That's sweet. That's really nice to hear. I mean, it's nice to hear because you would imagine like somebody that's being around all of these horrible, like scary things all the time that might jade them. But it's nice to hear that she was always very friendly. Oh, not at all. No, she Uh, had great empathy and she would drop anything. Well, so would my grandfather. They'd drop anything to help someone. mm. 
they were pretty special. Well, clearly, if they're traveling all over the world, you know, and especially sometimes, like, they're going on a whim. I mean, I would imagine when they are they were traveling to, like, England for that Enfield case, I mean, that must have taken quite a lot of convincing to be like, let's fly to another country, hope we... Well, believe. no, they were invited by the church for that one. Oh, okay. Yeah, the church asked them to check it out. Uh, but they weren't there long. They were only there for a long weekend or a week at the most. Oh, okay. It was actually uh, Maurice Grossman who was the lead investigator on that he did an amazing job he had been in that house for two years and he he got so much evidence he was amazing that case was not like the conjuring two uh and there was no none that doesn't exist Hmm. at all at all at At all all. no that's (laughs) that's james Wan. he he knew he wanted a monster to connect amy deville and enfield and that was something they added in post-production and came wow. back and did a couple of extra scenes. But they didn't know what the monster was going to be. When it turned out to be popular, then they created the movie The Nun. And actually, the only truth in the movie The Nun is in the credits at the end, where you see the exorcism of the character known as Frenchie. His real name was Maurice Thuriault. And mm-hmm. I was at that exorcism. I was the man standing between Maurice while he was under possession and the archbishop and my grandfather had a heart attack during that exorcism whoa yeah that was a bad one. Oh my god yes. uh so i mean I'm the, so your grandfather survived that he did uh yes that one that so what uh what was going on in the room like was it just yeah what what would have caused it oh this was a terrible case a matter of fact this case it impacted me more than any other case i've ever worked on i learned more the wrong way than I, well, we had been called in. His father, Maurice's father, had been this horrible monster. They were all farmers. And his father was abusive, was having sex with farm animals. Maurice caught him doing it and made Maurice have sex with a farm animal so that he wouldn't tell his mother. And... Then one day his father calls him and he says, Maurice, I just want you to know that I love you, which is the first time he'd ever said that. And he put down the phone. And while Maurice was listening on the other line, on the other end of the line, he went, he got his gun, went into the next room, shot Maurice's mother to death and then killed himself. What? Yeah. And then Maurice started having problems. He started getting attacked. He started, things started Apporting, which is like teleportation of in an inanimate objects. They would just appear and disappear throughout the house. There was writing that was scratched into his back in French. And he was the only one in the family that spoke French. He was French Canadian. His oh. wife was an American who didn't speak it and the kids didn't speak it. And he was illiterate. So they would read the words to him and then he would translate them. Oh. So they called my grandparents. My grandfather asked me to go with them that first day. And after we learned about the father, my grandfather thought, well, maybe it's the father causing this. So he said, Maurice, let's go to your father's grave and I want you to forgive him and tell him that you love him. So while we're standing there watching Maurice in front of the grave, crying his eyes out, telling his father that he loved him, he got punched under the chin so hard you could hear it. And he flew back through the air, flat onto his back, about nine or ten feet. Oh, my God. And my grandfather was sure this was a demon that was doing it. But I still, to this day, am sure it was the father. So he would, Maurice started coming under possession. One afternoon, we were in the uh, greenhouse. It was early spring. We were planting seedlings, helping It was me and my partner at the time, Ray Jefferson, and uh, Maurice and his wife, Nancy. And Maurice started complaining that he was getting really cold. I said, well, you know, it is chilly today. Go on over to the heater and get warmed up. We'll keep working. And then I, Ray said to me, Chris, look at him. And he was just standing there staring at us about 25 feet away from me. And I could see that his eyes had taken on this slit appearance like a snake. So I told Ray to get Nancy out of the greenhouse and back to the farm, farmhouse. And I started approaching Maurice, saying, by the power of Jesus Christ, I command you to be gone. 
again and again and again until he came out of it. When Maurice came out, he said, there's something wrong with my back. So I lifted up his shirt and there were three bloody crosses on his uh, white t-shirt. When I lifted up his t-shirt, you could see the blood on his back, but there were no cuts. So I said, all right, Maurice, let's go back to the house. I need you to give me that t-shirt. I need to get it analyzed. I need to see what kind of blood this is. Yeah. If it's blood. So he takes off the shirt in front of me and hands it to me, and there's no blood on it at all. It's like, where did it go? He yeah. still had blood on his back, but it disappeared from the shirt. What? And he would bleed from the eyes, bloody tears. He would vomit blood during the exorcism with uh, Bishop McKenna. He was doing all of that. And then when he actually came under possession on film, because we do have a film of this, you can see his cheeks take on a scaly appearance and his forehead cracks open. And yet I was standing two or three feet away from him and that was not there. It only shows up on this old video. Now, I had this video examined recently about three years ago in Costa Rica. Yeah. And they said, Chris, we haven't we had that technology up until, well, now, six years ago. There's no way that could have been fake. Gee, so what what do you think that kind of stuff is? I mean, if it's not a demon, I mean... I think it was the father. So yeah. the father's evil spirit was yeah. just... I think an incredibly evil, powerful man who's driven by hate, totally focused on destruction. And sadly, this is the thing. We didn't understand the need for psychology. I was going to college and I was studying psychology at the time, mm -hmm. but I didn't yet grasp that you have to deal with the underlying issues that make a person vulnerable if yeah. you want to have a successful completion to any case. And my grandfather fought the whole idea of psychology having any part in this. He, to really? him, it was all religious. It was all demons. So two years later, Maurice started sliding back because the traumas and the PTSD were still there. And he came under possession. Nancy kicked him out of the house, got a restraining order. But he came under possession again. She came home from work. As she was getting out of the car, he used his shotgun and he blew her arm off, dragged oh her bleeding into the kitchen. And for what for her seemed like several minutes, he just stared at her and she thought, this is it. I'm going to die just like his mother died. And at the last moment, he turned the shotgun on himself and blew his head off. Oh, my God. So we don't do this work lightly. And we always deal with the underlying issues, whether it's domestic violence, drug abuse, whatever it is, we're going to deal with that in conjunction. We take a very holistic approach. And, you know, I think that's smart for you to look at it from that angle, too, because, I mean, I'm sure there's more going on than just a ghost or, you mm -hmm. know, just a psychological uh, issue. Well, I guess, you know, that's something I've always like wondered. It's like, you know, if these are demons that are just choosing victims at random, like why wouldn't they go for the president exactly. or like a politician or something? It's always somebody that's vulnerable and usually financially in distress. So exactly. And that's something that I have actually, that's the argument I've made. I mean, if I were this timeless, ageless being with the wisdom of the ages, would I still do the same tired tropes that have never really seemed to get me anywhere? Mm. Or would I use my abilities more wisely and perhaps like flip a switch and destroy the world if that was my goal? Right, right. And, and another thing, thing you said earlier, which makes so much sense, which I'm sure when people are just watching the Conjuring movies or The Exorcist or anything, they're not thinking about this. But yeah, if this took place in any other country, in any other continent, well, most other countries and continents, it wouldn't be Catholic demons and they wouldn't be talking in Latin or whatever it. So it's, it is kind of like the mirror reflects back at us sometimes it seems. Exactly. Wow. That's very, uh, yeah, there's so many ways to look at this. So you, you coming into this, obviously from a family that had these beliefs and, and, you know, they were pretty dead set in that it was supernatural and paranormal. You looked at it a little bit more logically. Why, why that you think? Uh, I had a better education. I also was very lucky. My father was not a religious man at all. He didn't believe in the paranormal. And mm. my mother was Catholic, but 
very open-minded about it. I had taken catechism as a kid and it didn't really resonate with me. So when the Mormons came to the door, I was like, yeah, come on in. Let me learn about yours. Mm. And then, you know, it was Jehovah Witnesses. Then it was Zen Buddhism. Then I got to spend a long weekend with the Dalai Lama. And, uh, you know, I went to Nepal wow. for seven years and I was in Thailand for two years. And I was studying animism in West Africa with the Peace Corps. And I just, I broadened my horizons. Yeah. And I had so many psychological traumas of my own growing up. Uh, I was terrified of everything. And uh, I needed to understand that. So mm. studying psychology was natural for me. That's really cool. You have a very interesting life, Chris. I mean, for you to be able to travel with this knowledge. and, and But it almost seems like you had a purpose in wanting to understand what makes people tick in a way. Yeah, actually, yes. I learned early on, probably when I was about 14 or 15, that if I wanted people to like me, I had to be helpful. That was mm. my thing. And I, I don't believe in altruism. I help people because it makes me feel good. Right. You know, I, I'm not, I'm not that saint. I do it because it gives me purpose. It, it fulfills me. And I realized that that was my way, you know, because growing up, I didn't have friends. It wasn't until I learned to listen and learn to help others that all of a sudden I became a bit popular. Hmm. Well, I mean, hey, you must have been a good guy because, you know, my dad really speaks highly. Of you. So does my mom. My mom's been raving about you all week. She's so excited <laughs> to hear the episode. So. <laughs> I love um, both. Well, you know, you mentioned Bishop McKenna, and he has come up a few times uh, throughout the episodes. My mom has mentioned him as well as my friends. Um, so he would teach, was it Latin, or he would he would do Latin sermons in a church um, in Connecticut, right? In Monroe, yes. He, oh, um, in Monroe. he had been a Catholic priest who, when Vatican II came about and they got rid of the Latin Mass, he broke away from the church. And he huh. continued the Latin Mass. So it was very old-fashioned. But he and the Dalai Lama are the two holiest people I've ever met in my life. Really? They both shined. Interesting. You know, you mentioned the Dalai Lama earlier. Sorry to, to step away from Bishop McKenna. But how did you meet him? What, what, what was that all like? Oh, it was amazing. It was uh, There was this conference at a college. I think it was in Vermont. And some friends of mine who worked at a Buddhist temple had invited me to go see him and I ended up getting to spend the weekend with him. Wow. Did guided meditations with him, listened to all of his sermons and speeches and to, to hold his hand. Wow. I mean, it, it it's an electric jolt. He glows golden, honestly does. Wow. I, I've never seen anything like that. That's really cool. So Bishop McKinney, so he's teaching a, this Latin sermon and my mom, she had told the story basically about how when she was younger, she she played with a lot of Ouija boards and she was nervous about uh, having, you know, me be born with, I don't know, pre prepossessed or something like that. So she had gone to that church and they had done a pre-birth exorcism. Do you know about the story at all? Uh, no, but actually uh, baptism is a minor form of exorcism. Oh, is it? Yeah. It washes you clean of sin and any attachments. If somebody yeah. is being attacked and they're able to get another baptism, I recommend it. Right. Okay. So, oh, okay. So you can, if, if something's going on, you can go get another baptism and it might. It depends. Uh, it depends on the, the church. It depends on the priest. But yeah, you can. You just may have to shop around. Actually, oh. the sad thing is most parish priests don't believe in the devil, don't believe in the paranormal. And you wonder why are you a priest? Hmm. So you do think that if you're teaching the good, you you should believe in the bad. Well, if if you're teaching that the Bible is the literal word of God, right? Then you should be believing it yourself. And yet, most parish priests don't. Don't get me wrong. I'm not a Christian. I'm a pastor, but I'm a pastor without a religion. I hmm. think that there are many routes to God, many paths to God. And you may slip, you may slide, you may fall back, but as long as you're trying and you're showing empathy for your fellow man, you are as close to God as we can hope. This is an infinite universe, and there are trillions of living worlds out there. It would be the most egotistical thing in the world for me to think that I can understand the mind of God. 
right. my faith comes in accepting my ignorance. Hmm. But I'm curious, why do you think most priests don't believe in demons then or, or hell or the devil? I don't know. Uh, because the Pope, successive Popes, have all said that it's real. And they teach hmm. demonology. They teach exorcism rites at the Vatican. And now they've opened it up to other religions to teach them as well. And hmm. yet the local bishops, they're the ones that are more politicians. And I think that they're more worried about how the public perceives them. In South America, it's different. Here in South America, they're more open to it because they're predominantly Catholic everywhere here. Mm. And in the United States, it's looked down upon, it's frowned upon, and they don't want to admit it. Maybe because a little bit more about like the entertainment industry, it might make you seem like you're, I don't know, a little... Oh, yeah. Oh, I hate, I hate that stuff. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love a good horror film. I love it. Yeah. Especially the B films. I, I, I don't know why, but I, I just do. I think they're terrific. Give me a good monster any day. But there's only been one good exorcism film that I've ever seen, and that was The Exorcist. Mm, okay. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the best one, clearly. And everything seems like it's just trickled down from there. I mean, that Audrey Rose, was it called? Rosemary's Baby? No, Audrey's, Audrey Rose, the, what was it called? The Haunting of Audrey Rose or something? Uh, the Exorcism of Emily Rose? That's it. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah. That's based on a case in Germany, which was yes. horrific and sad as hell because they did 60 exorcisms on this girl, Annalise Mitchell, mm -hmm. without any medical supervision. And she ended up dying of dehydration and malnutrition. That never should have happened. You know, I saw that movie. I remember seeing it when I was 15 in theaters and it scared the hell out of me and then watching it recently for the podcast it wasn't as scary but i looked up the real story and there's videos on youtube yes, there and, are. you know cute it is way scarier what happened in real life than is what in the film yeah that's what i don't understand about hollywood i mean the enfield case was so much worse than what they right. portrayed in conjuring 2 i mean mm. the ridiculousness with my grandmother going through uh a flooded basement and my grandfather hanging out of a window by his fingertips and yeah. my grandmother coming in and screaming, Valak! Like, <sighs> that's going to get rid of something? Really? Wouldn't that be yeah. nice? Yes. You know, this is obvious. Okay, we, we should get into this then because obviously the films are very successful and it, it put your family's <laughs> name into the spotlight and everything. God help us. <laughs> well, that's the thing. I'm just very curious from your point of view. Yeah. How did this whole thing unfold and how do you feel about it? I'm grateful that it's given me the opportunity to create something that is helping people all over the world. That I'm grateful for. Mm -hmm. But I've also seen the damage Hollywood has done to my family, to others, how ego gets out of control, how people lose themselves. And I never want to be that person. Right. You know, I, I worked on, on, I work on documentaries. I uh, work even working on a reality program now, but it's not going to be a haunting of the week. It's going to be an educational program to empower people, to help people understand things better, to be interesting, of course, but to be interesting in a, a way that takes fear away, not instills mm. it. Right. And I think that, is a better message. And I, I figure, hell, I'm 59 years old. I'm not going to lose myself uh, to Hollywood. That's a good angle to have, though. I think, yeah, exposing it to understand it and to remove fear. I like that. Yeah. Yeah, because no, no other show on TV is really doing that. They're all just trying to make you freak out about hearing a slight sound or a little bump. Oh, uh, and if I can address that, please. Absolutely. If you hear footsteps in the middle of the night in your hallway... First off, make sure it's not something completely natural. <laughs> and even if it is a spirit, it chances are it's the old man that lived in the house for 35 years who still loves his home and protects it. Or it's your grandmother come to visit you. It's only yeah. your ignorance that takes what should be a beautiful experience and turns it into something terrifying. Don't mm. judge something by your fear. Judge it by exactly what is happening. If you right. haven't been hurt, then why are you afraid? Okay, fine. A coffee cup flew off of the shelf. 
maybe something's trying to get your attention. Hmm. It's not that it's evil. It had, it didn't hit you, did it? You know, take that with a grain of salt and look at it logically. Be skeptical about what you're seeing. Don't just right. jump to the conclusion that it's the devil. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to look at it. <laughs> Well, so so I guess a little bit back to the Conjuring films. How did how did it all start, really? I mean, did uh, James Wan and I don't I don't know if Universal. I think they did. Did they come to your family? I mean, how did those? I think it was Warner Brothers. Is it Warner Brothers? Warner Brothers. I th- I think. Yeah, uh, yeah. James Wan was a huge fan of my grandmother even before he met her. If you go back to the first Insidious movie, he named his main character Lorraine in her honor. Oh, okay, cool. That's awesome. Yeah. And so he he loved her and he had read The Demonologist and he really wanted to make a movie with her. Now, my grandparents had toyed with Hollywood, tried to get things going again and again and again. They had met with James Cameron. My grandfather wanted too much control and Hollywood doesn't give people control. Mm. So when this came around, my grandmother was on her own. My mother's husband was handling that side of things for her. I don't think he did a terrific job. I know that she never even made a million dollars out of the, what, two billion that they've made in Hollywood. Yeah. She, right. you know, and every penny they did make went to her health care. Uh, welcome to America. Mm. But at least she got to live at home. I was with her the last year and a half of her life. And uh, no. that was special. Yeah. But yeah, no, he was, James really loved her and Vera Farmiga, oh man, Mm -hmm. she idolized my grandmother. They loved each other. And Vera is a real like hippie, earthy woman, very sweet. Patrick Wilson is a terrific guy and a great Mm -hmm. actor, but he never met my grandfather. Really? And he's only going by what he sees on YouTube. Right. And I, I will say there's one scene, I think it's in The Conjuring 2, where he storms off of the set of an interview, angry as hell. And I thought, mm. yep, that's what my grandfather would have done. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I guess he did nail that aspect. Yeah, that one he that. got right, yeah. But I don't see my grandparents when I see them up there, you know? Right. It, it's too surreal for me. Yeah, they definitely like Hollywoodized it. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah. That's really nice though to hear that that Vera from you had uh had spent had, you know, really spent the time to get to know your grandmother and liked her a lot. That's awesome to hear. Oh, and Patrick was there too. Oh, he oh, he met your grandmother, yeah. not your grandfather. Yeah, not my, exactly. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, so that's great that they took the time to like be like, "Hey, we're making a movie specifically about these people. We should probably spend some time with them." Yeah, and they invited my grandmother down to the set. Matter of fact, in the first Conjuring movie, there's a scene at the beginning where the two main characters are doing a college lecture, and as mm-hmm. they're panning through the crowd, you see my grandmother sitting in the crowd. No way! Yeah. I know exactly the scene you're talking about. I didn't realize that. Yeah, that's so cool. So okay, so so they they enjoyed this process then. Oh yeah, very much, very much. Oh, that's that's really good to hear. Okay, and. You know, obviously the films, you know, anybody that sees based on a true story, they have to take it with a grain of salt and they have to know. Yeah, the most overhyped thing in Hollywood. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, I mean, I remember there was a certain time where it was like pretty rare to see that. And then all of a sudden, every single horror movie, no matter the context, yeah. it's like, listen, somehow this is still based on a Inspired true by true events. It's yes, another good exactly. one. Uh, so, okay. So, yeah. And then The Conjuring movies, the one off to do... You know, my co-host on the show, Eric, he's also he lives in Connecticut. He you know, he's on he's at a bachelor party this weekend. Unfortunately, couldn't be here, but he hadn't seen the Conjuring films until recently. And he had basically said that it felt like they had just made like the first one, just a mash of like, hey, let's throw every scary thing we can at the wall and see what sticks. Actually, that's the one that's most accurate. Really? Yeah. Oh, he'd, he'd love to hear that because he's like, yeah, man. And then like, you've got the Annabelle doll and like, that was successful. So they ran with that. Then in the second one, you got the nun. That was scary. So they ran with that. So yeah, I hear there's a second nun movie out now. I keep seeing the trailers. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the Annabelle movies are complete fabrications. Really? Annabelle's real. Believe me, I, I grew up with Annabelle, but Annabelle is not like the movies at all. The Conjuring movies are based on real cases, but the details are all incorrect. For instance, in Conjuring 1, 
my grandfather at the end does an exorcism? Absolutely mm-hmm. not. I'm an exorcist. <laughs> Oddly, an exorcist who doesn't believe in demons. <laughs> but my grandfather, he was Catholic. He didn't believe he could do that. But he, oh, oh, but oh, so in the film, they show him actually doing it. But your grandfather's like, I never, I don't know how to do that sort of thing. Exactly. He never would have right. attempted that ever uh, in a million years. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure, but people watching the movie, they're caught up. The music's going. There's a woman freaking out. They're like, all right, I, I'm in. I believe whatever I'm seeing. So exactly. Yeah. You know, yeah. and even in uh, Conjuring 3, that's based on a true case. I remember very right. well, but there was no satanic witch involved. It was a Ouija board mm. that got it all started. And my favorite scene in that movie is the very last scene of the movie where my grandfather, Patrick, takes Vera out to the backyard with her eyes covered and Mm -hmm. then shows her the gazebo that she had wanted. That is a fact. My grandfather did do that. Really? Yeah, and the gazebo is still there in the backyard. In Connecticut? Yeah. Oh, okay, that's nice. So I don't know if James Wan directed that one, but that's nice that like he's like, hey, like we we really need to honor certain things at least. They they got the love story right. Yeah, and you know you can really tell. You can really tell like the way they hold each other's hands in the movie, and you know. I never saw them hold hands. I will say that. Uh, Oh, (laughs) my grandfather was the polar opposite of my grandmother. He was a Type A personality. Mm -hmm. You know, everything had to be his way or the highway. And mm. my grandmother, every Sunday we'd have a family dinner and he'd be out on the street. Come on, Lorraine, let's get going. Okay, dear. <laughs> and then for the next hour, she'd be in the house saying goodbye to all of us, ignoring him completely. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. So sometimes opposites attract. I mean, in, in this instance, it really worked. It really worked. Yeah. Did your grandfather really like Elvis like in the movie? Uh, no, that was my grandmother. Oh, your grandmother. My grandfather thought rock and roll music, up until the 80s anyway, he thought rock and roll was satanic. And then in the 80s, he's like, actually, I love this now. Well, no, he just, he he realized he was wrong. Oh, okay. Yeah, he also had been confused about witchcraft, and he thought that was the same thing as Satanism for many years. And I was like, Gramps, it's completely different. And Mm. Satanism is the antithesis of Christianity. Witchcraft is a separate religion, and it's not necessarily bad. So it seems like you had a lot to teach your grandfather. Was he receptive to to learning? No. No, we butted butted heads all the time. Really? (laughs) He's a great Ed Warren. You know, what am I? I'm some punk kid. Yeah. Uh, Well, that's, I mean, mean, sounds like a great guy, though. Oh, yeah, he was. He was. I love my grandfather. We just came at the world from completely different places. When he was 16, he tried to join the Marines to go fight in World War II. Wow. By the time he was 17, he had met my grandmother, gotten married, joined the Navy, and went off to war. You know, so completely different experience. I know. You hear stuff like that, and you're just like, it doesn't even seem real now. We're so far removed from something like that. Like somebody going to war, coming back, marrying their high school sweetheart, having a whole life with them. It just sounds like a fairy tale. Oh, he, he got her pregnant before he left for the war. He was in oh. Japan when my mom was born. Oh, jeez. So how long was he gone then? How long was your mom being raised by uh, Lorraine alone? Uh, well, she was being raised by uh, Lorraine and Lorraine's parents. And ah. it wasn't too much longer. I think right after she was born, because it was 1946 when she was born. Mm-hmm. So he was on his way home anyway. Ah, uh, okay. Well, that's good then. How does your mom feel about this? Because she she's portrayed in the films a few times. No, oh, those are completely ridiculous. Uh, for instance, <laughs> she was my mother when Annabelle came to the house. She was already an adult. Oh. And she's not a psychic. She hates the paranormal. Terrifies her. She won't have anything to do with it. Oh, uh, does it do her friends tease her about the movies? Or uh, Not that I'm aware of, no. I, I think she, no. She, she, she's enjoying the moment. But she's a very private person. She has her uh, animal charity that she runs, oh. and that's her love. She loves taking care of animals. That's nice. So, you know, a question that I had for you. All right, so now, yeah, now that we've talked a little bit about how, you know, the Warren, I'm sorry, the uh, Conjuring films. Actually, you know, would you mind just, I feel like people need to know a little bit about the Annabelle case. Do, any insights you might have? 
Oh, absolutely. If you look at, I think it was uh, Conjuring 1, that's where the true story is. A- Annabelle mm-hmm. was a Raggedy Ann dog given to two nursing students in Hartford, Connecticut, back in like 67 by one of the mothers. And, <laughs> sorry for the cats. No, no, no problem. <laughs> and they loved this doll. It stood about, well, it's not supposed to stand, but occasionally it does. It's about three feet tall. And they would sit it at the kitchen table with them. They would take it to bed with them. And then one day, out of the blue, it just levitated its arms up onto the tabletop. And this was hmm. the age of Aquarius. And they were like, oh, wow, there must be a spirit in the doll. Let's have a seance. So they contacted a medium that they knew. And the medium came up with the story that's in Annabelle 2 which is a completely incorrect. Hmm. It, it, just a great reason why I don't trust psychics. But it was not a child, even though that's the story they were given. Now, as soon as they heard that, we've already got two nursing students who are very compassionate, very loving, and they immediately fell in love with this supposed little girl. They bought it a hmm. bracelet. They took it with them everywhere. No, no, no. Don't get off of the computer, little one. <laughs> Sorry. No, it adds a nice tone. <laughs> this is T'Challa. Oh, no, this is Shuri. T'Challa's the other one. Uh, you have four? Four kittens, yeah. We, oh, the my cat, gosh. The mama cat was abandoned when we got here, so now we're looking for a home for all of them. Because uh, I'm going to Sao Paulo, Brazil uh, in a couple of months, and I can't cart them around the world with me. Well, you talk to your mom. I mean, she's a huge uh, animal helper. Maybe she could help you out. <laughs> Getting them from Paraguay to Connecticut? <laughs> yeah. But um, anyway, to get back to the Annabelle story, they, you know, they started doting on it. But then Annabelle started leaving them notes on parchment paper, which they didn't own, in crayon, which oh. they didn't own, saying things like, miss me, want to play? And they also started noticing that Annabelle wouldn't be where they left it when they went to work. It'd be some other part of the house. And they started getting yeah. creeped out. Now, to me, this is an important piece of evidence because they changed how they perceived the doll. And it went from being playful to being malevolent. Hmm. They were feeding it their fear instead of their love. And it became something dark. Interesting. An egregore that I was talking about, or thought form, or tool. Right. And one afternoon, one of the boyfriends was sleeping on the couch, and he woke up and he said, I just had a dream that Annabelle was on top of me, choking me to death. And he walked across the room, picked up Annabelle, threw it across the room, and he said, you're just a stupid doll, you couldn't hurt anyone. As soon as he said that, he had claw marks raked across his chest. They immediately called the Archdiocese of Hartford, who luckily they got a particular priest who knew my grandparents. He called my grandparents and they agreed to go out and check out the the doll immediately. Mm. As soon as they saw it, my grandmother picked up on the negative energy. She interpreted that as demonic. My grandfather had already made up his mind that there was no way this could be a child because in his mind, God wouldn't allow a child to be attached to a doll. Right. Which I have found evidence that that's not correct. There was a case where another doll a hundred years ago had belonged to this little girl. And when her brother died, he loved her so much that he attached himself to the doll so he could be with his sister. And when, when they, the whole family died, he didn't know that because he's kind of in limbo. And it took our help to help him to pass over. Jeez, that's an interesting story. God. Oh, I had a few. Um, <laughs> yeah. But with Annabelle, as soon as they saw it, they said, yeah, this is something dark and evil. We will take it if you want us to. And they said, yes, please get rid of it. At first, they didn't know how to contain the energies of the doll. And they left it hmm. in the basement on a rocking chair. I actually had a, a friend of mine who was a priest, Father, Father Bill Charbonneau. He had come over to the house one evening with his brand new car, and he wanted to show it off. You know, he was a young priest. <laughs> and afterward, he said, hey, Ed, I hear you've got a doll that attacks people. And my grandfather said, yes, Father, it's downstairs. Would you like to see it? And Father Bill goes down with him, and 
walks across the room, picks up the doll, throws it across the room saying, God is stronger than the devil. And my grandfather looked at him and said, yeah, father, God is stronger than the devil, but no man is. Uh. And that night, as Father Bill was driving home in his brand new car, this white light came out of the sky directly at his car, and he swore that in the halo of light, he could see Annabelle just before he ran off the road. The car was ripped in half. He broke his leg, and he learned you don't mess with Annabelle. Okay. So you think in, in this instance, this is more of an energy that did exist initially as a, uh, as a benevolent force that was then turned by humans into a negative force that then started spreading. Exactly. It, it was created as a benevolent force at first through their love. But when mm. they started to get creeped out, then their fear turned it into something horrific. Wow, and that can spread that far to, to the point now where there's a film franchise exclusively about that doll. Isn't that crazy? That it literally could go that far. Yeah. Yeah. I like the first Annabelle movie. As a horror film, it stands up. It's very good. The second one mm. took me forever to get through. I think it took a year, <laughs> and I haven't even bothered with the third one. Well, I need to know, you knowing what it looks like, when you saw the poster, I mean, what did you think when you saw the, the movie version of the doll? Well, I figured that whoever manufactures Raggedy Ann dolls, maybe Hasbro, wasn't going to license that likeness to a horror <laughs> franchise that would destroy their business. So, yeah, yeah, I understood. Yeah. But honestly, come on. This guy goes out and he buys this God awful ugly doll for his pregnant wife. Yeah. Give me a break. I know. The doll's terrifying. You're just like, who who would buy this? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So well hey, you know, but but hearing your perspective on it, it, it really sounds like uh, your reality show where it's like, yeah, we're we're debunking certain things that, you know, like yeah, this doll it, it's it's not going to do the things that the movie version says that it would do. It has caused a lot of harm to a lot of people, but they learned how to contain the energies in the box with prayers and less salt and crucifix, etc., all around it, and it's contained now. It hasn't been a problem for decades. Mm, that's good. Well, it's a creep. You know, just people are afraid of dolls. I mean, I think that's just another thing. So, like the the lore of that yeah. and having a focus. Thing. It's amazing to me how many dolls are haunted, and I think there's a reason for that. <laughs> really. I really. It's just a theory. But my theory is, of all the objects that exist in the world, what is the one thing that we pour our love into? It's a doll. Mm. Nothing else. Children love their dolls. They're teddy bears. They're, they're clowns or whatever. And maybe clowns become malevolent because people often get creeped out by them later. Right. And all the things you mentioned, they are kind of like they, they resemble humans. It's not like a fire truck or like a ball or something. Exactly. Exactly. You don't you don't have an emotional attachment to the fire truck the same way. I mean, don't get me wrong. I've had plenty of cases where toys will start working without batteries in them and fly across the room with lights flashing. And, you know, but that's some spirit causing that to happen. It's not just some energy that's been imbued into it by a living person, unless we're dealing with possibly a poltergeist case, which can be caused by a number of different factors. It could be an out of control psychic. Uh, often people on the autistic spectrum are very psychic and they are not in control of their abilities and it can manifest as poltergeist phenomena. Really? And it can also be that it's a pissed off ghost who is now doing what we would call poltergeist phenomena. Okay, so, I, you know, I'd always heard that children are susceptible to this, but I didn't realize that people that are autistic and on the spectrum might also be susceptible to that. Oh, yeah. And actually, it can also be adults who have psychic abilities that they don't know how to deal with. I had a, a tremendous case in uh, outside of London where the woman had lots of issues. She was agoraphobic. But she was living on a property that had been a military hospital. It had been a sanitarium. And she thought she was haunted because she was constantly seeing ghosts. But the truth was, she just happened to be a psychic. 
and the ghosts were attracted to her aura. They were also attracted to her autistic son and to her teenage daughter, who all mm. had abilities. When we would try to help, those energies would get completely out of control. Her abilities were so bad and so out of control that every time she tried to talk to me on the phone, the phone call would drop. And I did an experiment where I had her mother hold, bring her phone over and hold the phone so that she would be able to talk to me. And I said, all right, now hand the phone to your daughter. As soon as she did, the phone call dropped again. It could only work what? if her mother was holding the phone for her. Wow. Yeah. Her energies were just out of control. So it, it just really, I mean, I've learned a lot from, from this conversation. So it just, it, it feels like there's so many different factors that play into uh, to a haunting, really. Oh, yeah. This isn't, it isn't easy work. It, it, it's something you really have to understand. And I'm a student. I'm no expert. If anybody tells you they're an expert on the paranormal, they're lying to themselves or to you. Yeah. Well, you know, I guess I just a few more questions for you then. So the these paranormal activity shows that are, have been on for like 15 seasons, some of them. Yeah. I mean, you know, they never show anything. I mean, at the I end know. of the day, like there's no evidence from any of these shows but people still want to watch them. Yeah, I've only seen two episodes of Ghost Adventures in my life, and that was enough to turn me off forever. He's the P.T. Barnum of the paranormal community. He's a great entertainer, I'm told, but he is unethical. He acts like he's under possession every other week. If you right. did half of the crap that they show on these shows in an actual case, you would either cause harm to the family or to yourself. Right. And I, it just, it's so unethical. The Warren Legacy Foundation has an actual stated code of ethics that we would love to see adopted mm -hmm. by all of the paranormal community. We don't want everybody to join the foundation. We're very selective about who's in the foundation. That's why we only have mm -hmm. a little over 100 members. But we would like to see them be ethical instead of trying to drum up some evidence, stir up trouble, and leave the family in the lurch. And we never use the word demon on a case, ever. Mm. It's just a loaded word. It's going to terrify the family. Our first job is to minimize fear, not to instill it. Yeah, and that's clearly the opposite of what these shows are doing. Oh, yeah, the crap. And, and But the thing that really like annoys me about them is they, they, they never show any real evidence, yet it continues year after year after year. And again... <laughs> Like how many years can you look for Bigfoot without ever finding anything? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I don't know. That's the thing. I just don't understand who's watching these shows and are just so like, oh, one day, one day they're going to find something. But well, I guess, do you want to kind of go a little bit more into the uh, Warren Legacy Foundation? Yeah, I would like to let people know how to get help. I mean, that's what I do this for. So people will understand where to come to get help. Yeah, please. You know, as I said, everything we do is free and confidential. We're very careful. We have a process we go through. We ask you to first go to our website, warrenlegacy.com or warrenfiles.com. There's a Google form on there on the contact us link, and you can either apply to the foundation there or you can ask for help there. We ask you to fill that out thoroughly so we have plenty of information. Then we'll have an interview with you with several of our people. We'll figure out a service plan to go on from there and work it and to help you the best we can. And you can also reach out to me, Chris McKinnell, on uh, Facebook. I guess I'm on Instagram and a few other things that I wouldn't even know how to find. So the website's probably the best way to go. Yeah, or Facebook for me. That's where I'm, I'm most easily found. It's, that's really great that you guys are offering this and that you also are very uh, selective, obviously. I think that's really important, too. Well, we only want the best because our clients come first. That's our, that's our goal. Right. We, our first goal in the foundation is to take care of our clients. Our second goal is to educate the public so that we empower them and minimize fears and help them to understand what's really going on. Then our third goal is to educate the next generation of researchers, again, code of ethics, and doing mm -hmm. it correctly without all of the pipe and bull crap. And our fourth is something my grandmother used to do one-on-one -on -one with uh, people, which is help psychics with their abilities. We have two online psychic support groups with about a thousand members around the world, both in English and in Spanish. Wow. 
And it's not a place you go for readings. It's not a place for people who are just interested in being learning about psychics. It's only for psychics. And we offer it for free, like everything. And it's a place that helps them to protect themselves, how to learn how to deal with your anxiety and your panic disorders, how to uh, psychically ground yourself, different forms of protection that are available to you, helping you to either learn how to manifest your abilities more fully or suppress them if that's your goal. And uh, Mm. we have been very successful. I'm very proud of the people that run that particular, those two particular groups. Well, actually, I'm proud of all of my members. They are the best. That sounds really nice, Chris. I mean, that's that's really great of you to do that. It sounds like you're you're just you're from a family that helps people and animals too, from your mom. So that's oh, and and my grandparents. Matter of fact, my favorite story of my grandfather. It was winter time, and he was driving down the street, and he saw this long-haired collie with a chain around its neck, wrapped around a tree in an icy puddle, all covered in mud. And he walked over, he unbuckled the chain, went to the door, slammed on the door with his fist. The guy came to the door and he said, you just lost your dog. And he brought the dog home and he named it after John Wayne. He named it Duke because that was his favorite uh, actor. Oh, that's so cool. God, Eric, he, he would love that story too because he's a huge John Wayne fan, my, my co-host. That's really nice. Yeah, I'm, I've been a vegetarian since I was five years old, so I'm a huge animal lover. Like, I just, so... I you want some cats? That. <laughs> you know, if I was in a different situation, I might actually take them. But right now, yeah, with the SAG strike going on, I'm kind of up in the air about where I'm going to be for a while. But yeah, man, I'm hoping that gets over soon. Me too. Well, my final two questions for you, Chris, if you have if you have another minute. Sure. So, you know, since this is a horror film podcast, I just got to ask, do you have a favorite horror film or one that you think is a good representation of, I don't know, paranormal world you know when i was 14 i was on a lecture tour with my grandparents and i met one of the three exorcists that worked on the actual case that the exorcist is based on Ah. that movie is one of the best it really is oh yeah it shows you what can happen for real in a demonic possession yeah so yeah that one highly recommend I, i love the conjuring one that was a great movie Oh, that's good to hear. That's really good to hear, especially for me. That's a really good to hear. That was a good one. I, I don't like the second one at all. The third one was okay. And The Nun, oh, as a horror film, it's fun, but it's it's ridiculous. Yeah, I remember The Nun freaked me out in The Conjuring 2, but I saw the actual film and I was like, eh. But um, yeah, The the Exorcist is just, it's timeless. And they're making an, a sequel. It's coming out in a couple months. So I'm kind of curious to see how that comes out. Yeah, they tried to make a few sequels with Linda Blair that bombed ages ago. Yeah, I know. This one has um, Ellen Burstyn. It has Ellen Burstyn in it. And wow. the trailer looks promising. So I know, she's 90. It's crazy. Oh my God. I know. Wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You haven't seen the trailer for this? No, I, I'm in Paraguay, man. <laughs> oh, right, right, right. Yeah. So they're doing a direct sequel. They've kind of forgotten all of the uh, the ones that have come out since since uh, 1973, and this is a direct sequel awesome. to that one. It's 50 years later. So we'll see. Trailer looks all right. Okay. Cool. So the Exorcist. Yeah. But so that, then I guess that leads me to my final question. Then, do you actually think that there are ways that you can make yourself more susceptible to this stuff, like Ouija board? Yeah. I, it's not. The board that's the issue it's your intention to communicate with spirit if you if you're somebody with an underlying negativity you're going to attract something negative or manifest something negative and that's dangerous Mm. it can be deadly i had a case where a guy named jose in uh, atlantic city i watched him come under possession 20 or 30 times in a two-hour period it was like very quick and but it constant and the church had come in they had done the evaluation they were certain that this was an actual possession case but church is bureaucracy and they didn't move fast enough Mm -hmm. and one evening his wife came home from work and he was under possession again and he said well f it i'm just going to kill him and he ran up to the top of the landing where he had a noose made out of uh, electrical cord and he put it around his neck and jumped off the landing and killed himself. And oh then when the paramedic and the police came, 
The body sat up in front of the paramedic and two of the police. His eyes were completely black, and he said, you can't have him. He's ours now. And then it dropped back down. Oh, my God. Wow. Yeah. That's stuff you can't make up. I mean, I guess you can make no. it up, but, I mean, it's it's record. <sighs> yeah, that's that's terrifying. Yeah. Well, Chris, I mean, uh, you've definitely... You know, you made me think about this differently, but I'm still still afraid. You know? you know, and that's just it. Most of the time, it's a beautiful experience. I've had a, an amazing experience in Argentina where I got a, contacted by an exorcist that I worked with. And she was r- really afraid one night. And I had woken up at 2 o'clock in the morning. And for some reason, I immediately went to my computer. And she was reaching out to me at that moment. And she said, a spirit has just walked into the room. And at first it was all in white with long flowing robes, like from the desert and barefoot. And as it manifested more fully, it spoke in a language she didn't recognize. And her skin turned brown with long black hair. And then she started showing the exorcist all of these images of the world in environmental turmoil. And the spirit said to her, we know who Chris is. He can't help you right now. And I thought, oh, crap. I know who this is. And I don't want her to know who I am. Jesus. So that knew you by name. Yeah. And I said, all right, this, she's going to come back. Make sure you record it next time. So the next morning or next afternoon, she remembered the words that this woman had said as she had walked in the room. And she told me the words. I recognized that they were Arabic. So I went to a friend of mine in Lebanon and I asked her to translate it for me. And the words were, my servants, I have a plan. She was speaking to somebody else, to somebody else's. Yeah, yeah. And so my friend got out her cassette recorder. I'm thinking, you know, she's going to get out her phone and record video. But no, she gets out her old cassette recorder and she hits record for 22 seconds. And when she played it back, you can hear chanting in Arabic. And I asked her to send me a copy of it. And I, again, sent it to my friend in Lebanon. It was the Lord's Prayer being chanted by two spirits in an empty house in Argentina, in Arabic. Yeah. And I realized that it was Mother Mary. And that's why I didn't want her to know who it was. I was like, you know, I don't care if demons know who I am, but come on. (laughs) What? Yeah. So how did you piece that together that, that it was it was the Mother Mary? I just I don't know. It, it she she was yeah. a blue flame at one point. We also have video of that. But I just knew, especially when we heard wow. this. And if you go to our YouTube channel, The Warren Files, there is that actual recording available for everybody to hear. Ooh. Oh wow, I didn't know that existed. I, I I'm definitely gonna check that out today. That's so cool. Yeah, you'll you'll see our story on Annabelle, my first case, all sorts of stuff is on there. We've got over a hundred videos. Whoa, okay. All right. Well, thank you for promoting that because I'm definitely gonna check that. I did not know that existed. So Yeah, my pleasure. I mean the production values aren't the greatest. I'm you know, I am traveling around the world, but we're working on updating my equipment. Well, I mean, hey. I think that's kind of part of the charm sometimes of these horror things is that they are of like lower production quality or they they just feel real, you know, they're not all glossed up. So and this isn't, yeah, you're not going to get, you know, me on a lot of cases or anything like that. We don't do that. We don't advertise our cases, mm-hmm. but I'll talk about the ones that have already been public or I'll talk about others without mentioning anything that it can identify my clients. Right. Well, it seems to be important to you guys. I mean, genuinely, it's about the help, not about scaring people into paying attention. Exactly. Well, Chris, I, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate this. You know, all of the insight, all of the scary stories, you know, just, just having you be this jovial, nice, friendly guy. It's just very refreshing. Well, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> but I know, seriously, I uh, we, I haven't really done a lot of interviews, so I... I couldn't believe that you were interested in coming on, so I, I truly appreciate it. Oh, it was my pleasure. Well, say hi to the cats for me, and good luck uh, down in Brazil. Thank you. Yeah, it'll be my second time in Brazil, and at least Bolsonaro's gone, and he was a crazy president. So I'm looking forward to uh, checking it out again this year. Nice. Well, uh, again, everybody, they can find your information on, can you just repeat the website and the YouTube channel for everybody? Yeah, warrenlegacy.com. 
or you can get me, Chris McKinnell, or Warren Legacy Foundation, uh, both on Facebook. And uh, The Warren Files, The Warren Files, uh, YouTube channel. Awesome. All right. Well, everybody, thank you very much for listening in, and we will see you next Monday with another horror film. Thanks, Alec. Thank you, Chris.